athletes. I want to transition to a topic that is specific to female athletes and that is not spoken about uh, enough, in my opinion. Um, the reality is, is uh, Abby, uh, you guys have to deal with menstrual cycles, which we don't. And some people might, you know, throw that to the side and say, oh, it's just, you know, a few days of the month and blah, 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 just get through it. But it does have a significant impact on uh, performance, mood, uh, many, many things that have to do with, uh, you know, the, your health to, first and foremost, and then your performance as well. So how, um, how, how, how do you navigate this uh, personally as an athlete? And then how do you, is there a certain awareness that's trying to be developed uh, on the, at the squad level so that everybody's aware of the consequences of, you know, not dealing with those things properly uh, or not maybe adjusting training according to, to, to certain things during certain periods of the month. So uh, if you can kind of run us through this and, and talk about it a little bit, because I really think it's, it's an yeah. important topic that needs to be, uh, you know, brought to light a little bit more. Yeah, it's definitely a taboo topic. Um, the amount of coaches that, and it's no disrespect to any of the coaches I've worked with, but the amount of coaches who don't understand it. And I think it's not, um, it's not in a disrespect way or a lack of kind of wanting to understand. It's just a lack of knowledge and kind of mm -hmm. how everyone deals with something differently. Like I might deal with it differently to how someone else in the team deals with it. Um, the different aches and pains I get, someone else might be completely fine, but also really angry or an emotional side will come out um and i definitely think it's taboo subject with it um i don't have any sciences like as much behind it um but i definitely went to um a talk about it and she was kind of saying like that the invitation to the, to the talk was to all like kind of female athletes and all their coaches um now we were in this room and there was 100 people and it was all the athletes it wasn't the coaches and it was just, it was really interesting because they spoke about how, how actually, not the coaches don't want to hear about it, but it's almost like, oh, like, okay, you get periods. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't care. And actually, no, like, I'm getting this period and like, I feel really shit. I can't like, do you know what I mean? I can't maybe lift as heavy in a gym or I think actually when you, well, I think when you're actually on your period or when you menstrual cycle, you can, um, you can lift heavier or something. I think there's the science behind it that, women do lift stronger when they're actually on. Um, and I think then when you come off it, there's a, you need to get your nutrition better. So I know I like, I eat more when I'm on and like, it's just little things like that. You don't um, realize. And I think for, um, especially with the sevens, it's quite hard to manage training as such because we're not individual athletes and we go all season. It's not like we um, aren't peaking for each month. Like, Eat every other month we have competition so it's not like we can we're individual and like if I was an individual athlete and I was a runner or something <laughs> you could really specify when I trained around it because mm. like I was just me but yeah. there's there's what 15 of us on the squad like we'd all miss like we'd out, be out there once a month or something and um, so it's kind of getting the balance but also I think coaches do need to have a bit more ownership and kind of of how we all deal with it um, and kind of educate, especially male coaches or male staff members and educating themselves how, how people deal with it and how it, it is beneficial and it also can be detrimental. Um, and that's not our, obviously not our fault, um, but it's just how we then, like how you deal with it. And maybe it's something that we definitely need to get better at is that could be like um, almost a question of how do you a start of the season? How are you on your period? Uh, like what are you like as a person so people know and it's just just knowing it like we don't care about talking about it do you know what I mean like we we don't care we'd rather tell people so like for example I can tell Lonna's uh, I feel I feel rubbish like I get back aches like my legs hurt but it only lasts a day and I should be fine the day and he knows and if I'm on, I'm on my period that day because we do loads of um like well-being and monitoring stuff in the morning but mm -hmm. if he knows he knows he's not going to come over to me and be like, come on, you can work really hard today and like really push me, like just poke the bear. Do you know what I mean? Cause he knows. Mm -hmm. And it, it, and if he wants to, that's at his own risk. You know what I'm saying? But do you know what I mean? So it's just, it's just basically, I think there needs to be a more of an education piece on it. Mm. Um, both for players and staff, I think as, as women, we can probably get better at understanding it more um, mm. and not, using it as a seen as an excuse because i think sometimes staff members like coaches might be like oh are you just using this as an excuse and actually understanding that 
some people might be and some people might not be you know and actually but it's the educational part um i think is the most important and then also talking about it is the second part and just making it a normal topic because Mm -hmm. especially i think i think this is right don't quote me on this but i think injury risks um when people girls on their period is greater so it's just how you how you like manage it i guess around it ben i'll let you bounce on that in a, in a second uh but going back to what you were saying abby and, and thanks for talking about this openly i think it is very important that both uh, athletes and coaches get educated on that topic because it, as a coach you're bound to work at some point with a female client a female athlete and like you said it does change quite a few things for uh, again like you said very individual responses a bit like nutrition everybody has different you know uh, specific needs and then everybody's going to react differently uh, uh, throughout their their menstrual cycle but it has to be acknowledged and it has to be taken into account because uh, you could you could do some damage if you don't take those things into account and and, and i think just even from a um, the word comfort comes to mind but it's maybe not the right one just you know making sure that you girls are being heard by the staff and that the staff just knows that it is a rea- like you said it's not an excuse it's a reality it's it's biology it's like it's, it's we're human and this is how it works uh, and and maybe you know just shedding light on it and making sure that everybody is aware that it's a thing it doesn't need to be a big thing it just it is a thing and we need to to work with it is 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 a definitely a very important part ben you i know you had a, a couple of things to add on that just, just on that i think yeah, yeah. it's like it, that's 100 percent, and i think it's just making it not a taboo subject <laughs> exactly um, but also it is an educational thing and i think it's an educational thing for players staff it's, it's for everyone and actually mm. i'd love to learn more like why do i feel like this why do i feel like like i don't want to get out of bed today like why that's so frustrating but actually if I go and I know so I ex- when I exercise, I feel better for it. So then actually it's understanding that. Um, mm. but it is definitely an educational bit. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> no, no, no. It's interesting too from an athlete perspective. I, I, I'm quite lucky in the fact that like one of the lectures I had to deliver uh, like across sort of rehab and, and strength and conditioning programs was around sort of the female athlete. So we, we sort of, uh, I, look, I mean, I'm, I'm by no means an expert in, in this area, but, you know, we had to talk about um, some of the, the, you know, the challenges with regards to the menstrual cycle. And I, I, I put down a few things from my lecture on here just to, to mind jot me today. But so if you, if you look at, you know, the menstrual cycle, there's, there's three stages of that. So you've got your like follicular stage, you've got your ovulation, and then you've got your luteal stage. Now, I'm, I'm sure the guest went into far more detail about this the other day than, 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 uh, than I'm going to. But you have sort of a pre-estrogenic spike around sort of that early follicular stage and then that mid-luteal stage. And then around that, you have also progesterone, which is sort of quite important when, when discussing about sort of the, you know, the female cycle as well. Mm. And I think like Abby said around, and, and before I, I guess go into some of these details, for me, a lot of this is you talk about psychology trumping physiology. So although some of the research and data suggests maybe no necessary changes in specific phases for certain sort of physical qualities, in fact, like the most important thing is what the athlete actually feels like. So like, although the, the, the literature and stuff has contradicting evidence around sort of strength changes through different phases, okay, what does Abby actually feel like? Because if, if she feels good in this stage, okay, let's, let's use that. If she doesn't, okay, I'm, by me telling her that this paper says this, she's going to turn around to me and go, no, I know how I feel. And it, it, that's, that's fair enough. You know yeah. how you feel as an athlete. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think that that's the important thing to, to, to bear in mind with this. But certainly around sort of strength changes, there's, there's some studies that look at you know, in those estrogenic spikes, sort of certainly that, that late follicular stage and stuff that you you get sort of increase in, in sort of maximum voluntary contraction and then talk about, okay, so how do I structure my training when someone's in their early stage of their menstrual cycle? Do I front load that program in terms of some of the strength and hypertrophy adaptations and then maybe change the focus as they sort of go uh, post ovulation and into that luteal stage? You know, a lot of a lot of studies do show that there's actually sort of no difference in sort of maximum voluntary contraction now again you have to take every study with a pinch of salt is that what what is the is the population they tested on was it elite elite was it sedentary and again you know are, are you using uh, using sort of isolated muscles or are, are you within some sort of dynamic task as well mm. so that that will that will completely change and how how you know the, the, the literature is read as well 
Um, I think certainly around um, core temperature and around changes of that. So it increases in, in concentration of progesterone actually increases the core temperature of an individual. Now, that, does that then have effect on sort of perceived RPE value? And then when you're doing a session, you need to then have, you know, an understanding of that. Again, Ab, I know sort of what phase Abby's at. I know that she's found this session, you know, really hard today. This is normally an easy session for Abby. She's normally a four or five, but now she's doing an eight and nine. And is that based on some of the core temperature changes? And around sort of estrogen then, you know, you know, attenuating those thermoregulatory sort of effects and does it, does it balance it out? Mm -hmm. I think certainly around uh, fatigability as well. So I'm, I'm just looking at a couple of points that I made. Um, so the greater the concentration of estrogen during sort of that luteal stage, like I said, it has the potential to reduce fatigability. So it has some sort of glycogen, you know, sparing effect. Mm -hmm. So again, like are, are the endurance qualities and like I say, does that then affect some of the RPE values within sort of, you know, different stages of, of the hormone cycle? Uh, and again, I know that there's different sort of metabolic responses between sort of lower and, and upper extremity muscles and how they fatigue and how they react to estrogen and estrogen receptors on each. You know, there's all these different things that you, you, you then need to think about. And then certainly around, you know, some of the neuromuscular changes that, you know, the girls have, like Abby mentioned about the higher injury rate. So it talks about, you know, uh, like Tim Hewitt's done a ton, a ton of research into ACL, um, ACL ruptures and different stages of the menstrual cycle. Now, mm -hmm. you know, estrogen and, and relaxing has an effect on the sort of the ligament laxity, tendon muscular laxity. You know, estrogen has an effect on certain components of sort of collagen resynthesis on sort of tendinous and ligamentous structures. Now, obviously, you're supposed to be more, um, I guess, more, more pliable and have more sort of laxity within your joints during sort of uh, your late follicular uh, stage where that, you have that estrogen spike. Now, that's something you need to take into consideration. And, you know, then, then you, you have to start to think about um, your oral contraception. So now estrogenic rise is quite good for tendon health. So when there's an estrogenic rise, you normally get um, more, like I say, it has an effect on tendons where you get more tendon compliance. Mm. So you talk about this balance in performance of tendon stiffness and increasing sort of rate of force development qualities in players or tendon compliance. Now, when there's an estrogenic spike, you, yes, it's probably better for healthier tendons, but in terms of performance gains, you know, you probably want a slightly stiffer tendon, more increased risk to injury, but then at those stages where there's not that estrogenic spike, you know, you can start to develop more tendon stiffness qualities. Mm. Now, then you talk about people who are on oral contraceptives and, you know, there's, there's papers that look at their athletes, even though they might not want to go and might not need them, how oral contraceptives actually flatten out that estrogen and progesterone and give you a more steady supply throughout the cycle that if you are peaking for, say, an Olympic Games or, or competition, you know, some athletes will go on oral contraceptives just to flatten out that estrogenic level so they can get that increased stiffness within a tendon because their ultimate aim is for that rate of force, for force development, that, you know, explosive reactive quality. So, mm. you, you know, then you go into a, you know, then you go into a completely different realm that you, you're now talking about, you know, females who are ingesting stuff to, to change hormones. And, you know, it's, it, it, you can go into a minefield of all this. So there's like a huge amount of, you know, research out there it's still a very new area so there's still very limited research on how menstrual cycle affects like neuromuscular function um you've then got sort of anatomical differences so things like they talk about differences in female q angles and whether that affects tibial torsion you know febrile uh, antiversion you then look at sort of narrowing of that intercondylar notch so because females have a slightly smaller in, uh, intercondylar notch does that lead to a smaller acl you mm -hmm. then talk about foot position and do females then suffer from increased pronation which relates to like a navicular drop which then increases the anterior tibial translation you then talk about you know quad hamstring ratio at different stages of the menstrual cycle and how you know more males have an early activation of quadricep uh, sorry of hamstring over quadricep so protect protects that tibial translation of that tibia whereas you know females are quite quad dominant naturally so therefore probably doesn't help in that anterior translation so how can you even out that ratio and then, you, you know, then other factors around sort of landing mechanics, deceleration mechanics and how that, you know, that, that all changes as well. But I think, you know, I, I wrote a little note to myself and I said, you know, there's all these differences in menstrual cycle and there are changes. And like I said about Abby's point is that the psychology does trump physiology. But if you have a big group of individuals, does a good training program negate all the challenges that females face with a menstrual cycle? So if you have a good understanding of their perception and their psychology around it, by you 
having an awareness of that, like Abby saying, by looking at some of the wellness data and a conversation with an athlete uh, around that time that you know that they're, they're going to feel susceptible, does a good training program and a well-planned training program actually just help and negate all these differences that you potentially see in fairly new research? Mm. So, um, sorry to, to ramble on about that. A bit, no, a bit more you have. No, no, no. It's, an, it's, an, it's, a really ask, right? it's a really interesting one. And I think it's, it's helping it. I don't think it's, I, I don't really, I don't think I agree with the changing the program. I don't think. Because <laughs> um, <I don't, laughs> there isn't enough to me. There's not enough data with it and actually you don't need to change it you just need to you understand an athlete and actually you have to like like me and Ben are saying is you have to take time and that like that educational piece is the well-being piece and it's it's, it's a bit of everything it's not changing this it's just going okay you're not okay today okay we'll get through it today tomorrow you'll be fine again you know and it's it's how you work with individual athletes within a team sport rather than making the making a program within a in, for an individual yeah maybe to to bring that back to the practical side abby if you could give an advice to you know maybe female athletes who are listening and who maybe don't have the luxury of having understanding coaches and staff how can they bring that forward to uh maybe a coach in a in a performance environment just so that it is you know known and that again we try to break those taboos because I think the what Ben did on the, on the education side is there is, is super interesting and relating some of the research. But at the end of the day, we need more people to talk about it. So what would you recommend to someone who's maybe a little bit afraid to, to talk about those things? Yeah, I think it's a real it's a real tough one. Um, it's not an easy thing to do at all. Um, something I'd probably do if I was in that situation um, is firstly, see if there's a female staff member um, to speak to and actually be like, like because it is more comfortable to speak about that kind of stuff um if you're not as as confident um but i would then probably find like an educational piece um so online um there's a company it's lucy's and sisters and they are trying to break this taboo um and there's like different like kind of almost videos or athletes and there's, there's this podcast right here you know um there's this podcast that you can take if i was an athlete and wasn't so sure i'd be like there's a like could you listen to this part of this podcast because actually I'm really struggling like I just want you to hear it and and if the coach kind of doesn't react well to it then a little bit that's on them like that's that's a bit shit on them um Mm -hmm. but it's even if you're the first step is kind of just saying it and like acknowledging it and making them aware of of how you feel and actually if that's I always believe if that's how somebody feels, you can't be wrong. You cannot be wrong with how you feel. So if that's how they feel, that's how they feel. Mm. Um, and it's just the after part will also be easier because they know how you feel. And then hopefully you can just educate them and educate yourself into to how you fix that. That's that problem. And then uh, from Abby, just, I'm oh, yeah, sorry, I was just going to ask. No, go Abby ahead. Go ahead. A, yeah, sorry. I was just going to ask Abby from a, I'm just really intrigued. So, um, <laughs> From a male staff member in a female environment, what do you feel that like a male staff member could could do to maybe help that process? Do you think it's worth initiating a conversation just so you raise a point that you have an awareness of this and that it's an important factor to discuss to try and make sure you know the, the group are comfortable with that? Like, what what would be maybe if your advice that, for some? If the male if the male staff member came and just said, "Look, I know you all have periods. I know you all have match cycles. Like, I'd like to understand." each you individually oh, okay great like we don't care we don't want to like we're not trying to hide it and like some people might be a bit more embarrassed about it um but actually it's so natural it's super super natural and i think if the the male staff member or whoever it is took the first step often that is easier because you go okay this is a thing they need to do for the whole squad it's not just me it's it's he's trying to understand everyone in this squad you know and it's more of a Oh, like you want to understand us on a nutrition point of view. Oh, okay, I understand. Oh, you want to understand us on a sleep point of view. Oh, okay, I understand. Oh, you want to understand us on a period point of view. Oh, okay, I understand. And do you know what I mean? It just kind of gets into that normality because it is so normal. But Ben, maybe if you can close close that topic with a, a piece of advice to, to coaches who might still, after even listening to that, uh, still be reticent to, to actually dive into it and just, just you know, understand it a little bit better and open up that line of communication uh, with their female athletes, what, what would you say to them? 
Yeah, I just I, you know you know I think I think it is like Abby said it is a is a hard topic to discuss, but I think you know it's it's part of your role as as sort of a strength and conditioning practitioner to have an awareness of this. So your role is to have an awareness of all aspects of performance and how they can affect that individual. Mm-hmm. Now you know as Abby's pointed out, this is a big area and a big aspect for female athletes on their performance. So I think having some even if it's just the basic awareness of some of the basic fundamentals around you know what what are the challenges faced what what do the changes lead to sort of in terms of physiology uh etc um and just being able to be open you know and have that discussion with your athletes i think that that'll get you a long way and and you know this all relates to some of the stuff that me and myself and abby spoke about at the beginning and is how do you build that environment build that culture within your female group and you know showing that you care for me is is a big thing uh, for for buy-in and again this relates to that I'd go up to Abby and start discussing this. So she's like, well, you know, he actually cares. So, uh, you know, I think that all relates back to some of the earlier points. Mm-hmm.